Okay. Well, hallelujah and welcome back. We're back to do the chronological gospels. It's been a long time, but welcome back. If you watch us on YouTube, welcome back. We're on Z live on Zoom. Jones with us, Mike's with us, and you're all welcome to join us if you want to join us live on Zoom every week. And I never thought I'd ever be saying this. Monday afternoon Bible study, <laughs> hallelujah. It's our Monday afternoon Bible study at two o'clock on Zoom, and then it will be on YouTube. So we're picking up with the chronological gospels. You know, we left off about a year ago when we were meeting on a Friday night, but we're going to go right back to where we actually left off on YouTube because we've got a series already underway on YouTube going back a while now, but we're going to just pick up where we left off. And so by way of a segue, I'll just go back to where we did leave off, although the last recording covers it in detail. We're not going to go into the detail now, just to get back into the narrative of where we left off. And where we left off was Matthew chapter 2. So you're only just getting going again in the Gospels, which is great, because this is on tour with Yeshua. That's what this is, the Gospels. It's being on tour with Yeshua. We're just getting going again, as you'll see today. And then next week, we'll start to get right into the ministry when Yeshua gets baptized, etc. So we're going to be on tour with Yeshua. But before we start, we just let go back in time to Matthew 20, uh, Matthew chapter 2 and verse 19. Matthew chapter 2, verse 19. So just give you a chance because it's good to follow this through in your Bible. You can ask questions or you can put questions up on YouTube and we'll deal with everything that comes up. So it says, now when Herod was dead, because that's where we left off, Yeshua had fled, hadn't he, with, with Joseph and his mother Ma Miriam, had gone to Egypt because Herod was killing the kids under two to try and kill the Messiah, the king, because he was aware that the king of the Jews had been born. And so they went to Egypt, but this was all like we had like we studied last time, so that the prophet Hosea would be fulfilled out of Egypt. I have called my son. And you know, Matthew was showing us that Hosea was prophesying about Yeshua coming out of Egypt. So he's in being in Egypt, and it says in verse 19, when Herod was dead, behold, an angel of the Lord, an angel of Yah, appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt, saying, Arise, take the young child and his mother and go to the land of Israel. For those who sought the young child's life are dead. Then he arose, took the young child and his mother and came into the land of Israel, came out of Egypt. It's such a, you know, it's a repeat, isn't it? It's, it's the following in the footsteps of Israel. Jacob went down to Egypt. And then God brought them out of Egypt. Well, brought them up out of Egypt, as we'll see a bit later. That's the language we love to use. So, but it says, when he heard that Archelaus was reigning over Judea, instead of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. Being warned by God in a dream, he turned aside into the region of Galilee, and came and dwelt in a city called Nazareth. I mean, that's where Joseph and Mary were from, wasn't it? That's where they came from. Which was spoken by the prophets, he shall be called a Nazarene. And we looked at that in detail on the last video. So watch the last video, get up to date. But the message of this is, is that Yeshua was always going to come from this place. And the prophets never actually said he will be a Nazarene in those terms. And that's what we looked at last time in Isaiah where it's Yeshua is a netze, a netze, and a netze is one that springs forth from the root system of an olive tree and a new tree springs forth. So that's a netze. So now we're going to Luke, going to Luke chapter 2. And we're picking it up in verse 29. And just by way of an explanation, just so you can be in the Luke narrative, Luke in chapter 2, verse 29, is Yeshua in the temple as, as a baby. He's, in, he's a baby, and Luke says it like this. So when they had performed all things according to the Torah of Jehovah, they returned to Galilee, to their own city, Nazareth, 
and the child grew and became strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. So Luke, is, that's a short account because we've seen previously that before they actually go back to Nazareth, they go via Egypt, and Matthew gives, them, gives us them details. But Luke's just this short account, and that's going to bring us to the next appearance of Yeshua in the temple, because he's in the temple now. Um, as a child, as a baby, but now we're going to move forward 12 years or so to the next part. But let's just mention that again. The child grew and became strong in spirit, wow. filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. Now we're adopted into this family, aren't we? This is part of our inheritance that we can grow and become strong in spirit and be filled with wisdom. This is how Paul prays in Ephesians and the grace of God upon us. So I just pray that for you're all watching now and taking part in this study over the next period of time that we'll be in, that we will grow during this, Lord, that we will grow and that we will become stronger in spirit and that we will be filled with wisdom and that the grace of God will be upon us, remain upon us from glory to glory, Lord, as we grow in this faith as we follow you through this these lessons amen so where we pick up now this luke chapter 29 chapter 2 verse 41 yeah verse 41 12 years forward his parents went up to jerusalem every year at the feast of passover and he was 12 years old when they went up to Jerusalem, according to the custom of the feast. So, you know what we do? We go into this, run through this quickly. We're in a rush, are we? Plenty of time. We're going to take our time on this wonderful journey. His parents went up. And that is a phrase we need to understand and be familiar with, because this is the language of the Bible. To go up. We go up to Jerusalem. You'll see it in a couple of verses that they go down to Nazareth. Now, Nazareth's north of Jerusalem. Normally, you'd go, you'd think you were going up the country to Nazareth, but we always go up to Jerusalem and come down from Jerusalem. And this is going up to the Feast of Passover. And I, I'm so encouraged, to be honest, to be starting this study again at this time because we were in this narrative where we, on, on the Sabbath, couple of days ago and we were talking up in Exodus 12 when we got introduced to Passover so it's just so timely to be coming back to this now that we really have got a greater sense of Passover after what we've just been studying in Exodus 12 and when you really understand that Yeshua undisputedly is our Passover that's like the strange language it shouldn't be strange language anyway because paul says it in first corinthians chapter 5 messiah is our passover and that is a big inspiration for this study is that we will understand and truly behold the lamb of god because the lamb of god is our savior he's our savior isn't it there's no other way of salvation other than the lamb of god his blood redeemed us, understanding the Lamb of God slain from before the foundation of the world, and then understanding that he chose to adopt us before the foundations of the world. It just connects you with this language of the Lamb. So what a beautiful place to start this study again, going up to Jerusalem for Passover. <laughs> and look at the language. This week when we start the Torah portion, this week, We'll be in Exodus this week when we start, and it'll be Exodus um, 13, where we start this week. And I'll just read a bit of it, just for the language. Exodus 13, verse 17, that's where we start this week's portion on, on the Shabbat, Beis Shalach it's called. When it came to pass, when Pharaoh had let the people go, that God did not lead them by the way of the land of the Philistines, although that was near, for God said, lest perhaps the people change their minds when they see war and return to Egypt. So God led the people around by the way of the wilderness of the Red Sea. Listen, and the 
children of Israel went up in orderly ranks out of the land of Egypt. It's a Passover event. <laughs> and they went up out of Egypt to the land of, you know, on the journey to the land of Israel. And this is the word in Hebrew, Allah, Allah. You've probably heard it more when you've heard about people who are making Aliyah, they're going up to Jerusalem. People from all over the world now are they are starting to, what I've been doing for years, making Aliyah. And really that means going up. They are going up to the land of Israel, to Jerusalem. So this is the biblical language, and you see it right there in Exodus 13, which is part of the Passover narrative, that when the children of Israel came out of Egypt, they went up out of the land. So how right is this language? It's great, isn't it? So let's have some more of that then, if you don't mind. Let's have, we could have either Isaiah chapter two, or Micah chapter four, but you know, we'll have, we'll have Micah chapter four for this language. It's like to read the prophets. So we'll read Micah chapter four. Chapter four, verse one. Now, this, I mean, Paul says desire earnestly that you might prophesy, so I'm going to do it. I'm going to prophesy because this is the prophets, the words of the prophets, just repeating them <laughs> in this day and age in our land now. It shall come to pass. It shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of Yehovah's house shall be established on the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and the peoples shall flow to it or him. Many nations shall come and say, come, let us go up to the mountain of Jehovah, to the house of the God of Jacob. This is what's gonna happen in the latter days, we're doing it. For uh, he will teach us his ways. We shall walk in his paths. He's like the good shepherd, hasn't he? Who's made a path for us. For out of Zion, the Torah will go forth. This is an end time, latter days prophecy. I'm so glad to be part of it. Uh, out of Zion, the Torah will go forth and the word of Yehovah from Jerusalem. You see, this is how connected this all is. I'm going to carry on reading this prophecy. He shall judge between many peoples and rebuke strong nations afar off. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hoops. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. But every one shall sit under his vine and under his fig tree. I just wanted to carry on reading that for when we get to Nathaniel in a few weeks. <laughs> Nathaniel's sitting under his fig tree and Yeshua sees him under his fig tree. <laughs> and no one will make them afraid. This is great. For the mouth of Yehovah of hosts has spoken. All people walk each in the name of his God, but we will walk in the name of Yehovah our God forever and ever. And that's just why I wanted to read that, because that's going up language. <laughs> In the latter days, people are going to say from all the nations, come on, let us go up. And I, I, I'm with, I know we might, and Joan, both, both of you, we watched these videos recently, haven't we, about the city of David and the discoveries and the, the pathway that leads up from the pool Shalom to the Temple Mount, that it's all being uncovered in these latter days to make that way up. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. I love it. Oh, going up. And I'm just another mention for you, just so it's something you can add to your studies, to your understanding. We're coming up to that Passover season soon. So we really ought to be learning these ways. And the way you would go up would be marvellous because there's a series of Psalms in at the beautiful book of Psalms called the Songs of Ascent. Psalms 120 through to Psalms 134. These are the Psalms to prepare us. I mean, I used to be a football fanatic 
And whenever we'd travel to Wembley or abroad, you'd have all your songs that we'd be singing all the way there and everything. But these are the songs that the God of the universe, our Heavenly Father, has given us to sing on our way up to Jerusalem. And they're so wonderful. <laughs> they're so wonderful. They give you so much hope about what our destiny and our future is. That to not avail ourselves, but just be denying ourselves. We want to understand our citizenship, our destiny. <laughs> well, if you read the song, the songs of a sense, you'll do well. Okay. And it was other things we could just mention. It says that they were going up according to the custom of the feast. And so if you want to understand the custom of the feast, well, Exodus 12 is where we were on the Shabbat, and that's necessary reading for Passover instructions. And then Exodus 23 says you three times a year, three times a year you must appear before me and celebrate these feasts. And Deuteronomy 16, verse 16, says that you must come to the place that I will choose. And now we understand that this is the place, Jerusalem is the place that Yehovah chose to put his name. Yeshua will return to Jerusalem only. He's going to come, he's not come back to New York because New York's the new capital of the world. He's coming back to Jerusalem. Jerusalem's the capital. The king of kings is going to sit on his throne in Jerusalem in the latter days. In the latter days, we will go up in the millennium. Every tabernacles, the nations must come up to Jerusalem. How can anyone to even think that these things are? Done away with. So there's the, some insight on the custom of the feast. And Leviticus chapter 23 is obviously they're all necessary readings for these feasts. But let's move on in our narrative back into Luke chapter 2. And it says, where, where are we now? Verse 43. When they had finished the days, the boy Yeshua lingered behind in Jerusalem, Jerusalem. And Joseph and his mother did not know it, but supposing him to have been in the company, because they all went up in company, didn't they? You know, let all the tribes come up together and it was all coming a big pilgrimage caravan. Well better than going to match. Well better than going to Wembley. You know, it just is. They were all in this company of people and, you know, not worrying about the kids. They were all, oh, they'd be with the cousin or they'd be with that family and, you know, we'll see them all. Sorry for tea. They didn't worry about it. They supposed that he was in the company and they went a full day's journey. <laughs> a full day's journey. And they sought him amongst their relatives and acquaintances. So when they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem seeking him. <laughs> A wonderful phrase. There's a couple of people who I've already introduced you to on the previous recordings, but seeing that's been a long time, I'll just remind you again of some of the great um, Christian sages that we've got. Matthew Henry, probably one of the most famous. Matthew Henry. I haven't um, read any of this study without reading Matthew Henry's commentary on everything that I'm reading, just to equate myself and come across wonderful things that I'll quote from time to time. And then Matthew Henry introduced me to another guy called John Lightfoot. John Lightfoot was obviously um, a contemporary, or whatever the right word is, he was before Matthew Henry, and Matthew Henry learned a lot from John Lightfoot. And whenever he referred to John Lightfoot, I think it was this John Lightfoot. So then I found John Lightfoot's commentaries, and John Lightfoot's commentaries are delightful. I mean, a real, real scholar of his time, and um, his speciality was the sort of culture of Israel and Judaism and the whole backdrop. And so he brings wonderful insight into this. A real bona fide scholar that Matthew Henry introduced me to through his writings. So this is something that um, John Lightfoot made me aware of. And he's saying that when it says he went a, a day's journey, he said a day's journey from Jerusalem in that direction the first stop-off point was Shechem, which I think is quite amazing when you understand the history of Israel going right back to Abraham. When Abraham arrived in the land, when he left his land, came out of Haran and arrived in Israel and came to Shechem in chapter 12 of Genesis. And then 
so much happens at Shechem, doesn't it? So much happens, you know, Dina was raped at Shechem, wasn't she? And then the slaughter that took place at Shechem. Joseph, when he was um, sent by Jacob to go and find his brothers, he went looking for them in Shechem, didn't he? And ended up getting sold into slavery. Joseph's bones, when he got brought back to the land of Israel, in Shechem, Shechem is this day called uh, Nablus. And I mean, it's a, you know, it's a place you don't go for a, for a, a day out, really. You know, it's quite a nasty place these days but that's Shechem so I just thought that was interesting and especially when you realise Yeshua will be back at Shechem to meet the woman at the well because that's where the woman at the well is Shechem it's just an amazingly important place so I'm sure there's a lot more in that but just these little things you pick up are wonderful and then here's, here's something from Matthew Henry which I'll just quote from Matthew Henry because what's happened here is Yeshua's mum and dad or stepdad, you know, Joseph and his mum, Miriam, have lost Yeshua. Have they? <laughs> They've lost the Saviour. And so Matthew Henry's take on it is this, is if you've lost the Saviour, go back. Where, where did you lose him? Where did you lose him? And there's a real message in Revelation about that, and that's what he's saying. So he says this, those that will find Christ must seek till they find. Those that would find Christ must seek till they find for he will at length be found of those that seek him and he will be found their bountiful rewarding those that have lost their comforts in christ and the evidence of their incest in him must bethink themselves where and when and how they lost them and must turn back again to the place where they left last had them must remember from whence they have fallen and repent and do the first works and return to their first love. Matthew Henley's quoting from Revelation chapter 2, the message of Yeshua to the Ephesian assembly, return to your first love. And it's just a great message in these days that we need to come back to this teaching. You know, that's what we've been doing for a few years now, but coming back to the Hebrew faith, the faith of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob is a messianic faith. And that's why we love to study the Torah every week. It's what the disciples were doing in the book of Acts, chapter 13. They were in the synagogue on the Sabbath, studying the Torah and the prophets. So we need to come back to where this faith originates and where it's all headed to, <laughs> Zion. So that's a great little side note, I would say, from two fantastic Amen. teachers of this faith. So let's carry on in our narrative of Luke. And we're up to, uh, now, so it was, verse 46. Now, so it was, after three days, three days, they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the teachers, both listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were astonished at his understanding and answers. So just picture this scene, your shoes, 12 years old. I mean, that's the age there or thereabouts when a Jewish boy would become a son of the commandments, take his bar mitzvah and become known as a son of the commandments. So he's around that age. You know, he's, you can imagine how Jewish elders would be so welcome of a young Jewish boy, I want to teach them and engage with them. But you see us sitting. <laughs> now, if you, once you get to know us a bit more, but if you've been with us for a few years, you know, whenever I come across the word sitting in the scriptures, I've got to mention Psalm 110. I've got to. I've got to mention Ephesians chapter 2, where it tells us that we are seated in the Messiah in heavenly places and psalm 110 shows us that yeshua is seated at the right hand of the power on high yeshua used this language himself when he was in his trial and they were saying we put you under oath tell us you the messiah and he said to them because he was under oath you had to and said he was silent as a lamb up to this point 
he wasn't answering but when he was under oath he had to bring an answer and so his answer was well it's as you say but he went further <laughs> he said i'll tell you this <laughs> from now on you'll see the son of man sitting at the right hand of the power on high and the high priest tore his robe at this it's a melchizedek revelation it's wow. for us because we are seated in him so i love this language of being seated but there's another gem i would say from john lightfoot john lightfoot this custom of sitting prevailed after the death of gamaliel who took the chair many years after this that we are now upon what he's saying is sitting down in the temple in this format was not on that was not the way it was done then he says the great hillel possessed the seat at this time or if he was newly dead he died around, died around this time his son Simeon succeeded him so that it was, it was the disciples part in this age to stand not to sit in the presence of their doctors so Yeshua is so you know he's, he's years ahead isn't he but let's have it right this he might be 12 but it's Yeshua he's God in the flesh where is he? In the temple, in the place where Yehovah chose to put his name forever. He's sitting there. He knows who he is. <laughs> he knows who he is. It, what time of year is it? Passover. Passover. We'll be holding the Passover Lamb of God here. And Luke is telling us about this. And I'm so glad he is. Because Yeshua knows exactly who he is what he's about, what he's here for at this age, as we'll see. Isn't that amazing, though? So, and the other thing I just mentioned now as well, because Yeshua does it in sort of reverse order in Luke. Luke Yeshua's in the synagogue in Luke, and there's a woman who's bent over, isn't she? Bent over. And there's a real uproar. The, father, the, the, the leader of the synagogue's not happy at all. He's like, look, there's, there's six days you can get healed. Come on, one of them. You know, this is the Sabbath. <laughs> Yeshua says, well, ought not this daughter of Abraham, who Satan has bound for, and he says, think about it, 18 years. Well, Yeshua's 30 at this age. So think about it, 18 years is going back to when Yeshua was 12, which is, I think, is amazing. And then he says, oh, not this daughter of Abraham, that Satan is bound for, think about it, 80 years, be loosed on the Sabbath. You know, hallelujah for the Sabbath, Lord, and for, you know, for what you do on the Sabbath, set people free, all going back to that time, you set the people free from Egypt, which we remember every Sabbath, hallelujah. Oh, this faith's so beautiful. It is, isn't it? Beautiful. So that's just, you know, connected with the age of 12, etc. But what I was going to say is how well received he is at the age of 12. It's going to be the same people, the same Pharisees, the same elders, or the sons of them people in 18 years' time when they don't receive Yeshua so well, do they? You know, eight, 12, at the age of 12, they're loving him and amazed at his wisdom. And wow, but in 18 years, they won't receive him when he comes back to this place with his message, which we'll look at in a bit more detail. So, okay, um, so when they saw him back in Luke, they were amazed. This is back to Mary and Joseph now. When they saw him, they were amazed. And his mother said to him, son, why have you done this to us? Look, your father and I have sought you anxiously. That reminds me of uh, Leviticus 10, when very centre of the Torah it is uh, it, and it says that Moshe darash darash he saw diligently the sin offering that just reminds me of that phrase he saw him anxiously like Moses saw anxiously the sin offering well you sure it is the sin offering isn't it we've sought you anxiously and here you sure said to them why or how how did you seek me did you not know that I must be about my father's business, is what our translations say. I found it interesting just checking it out before in the Greek, there is no word in there for business. 
there isn't to, to the same for my father's business. The NIV and some other translations translate it as father's house. Well, that makes sense as well. I'm not saying it's not business. It just doesn't have the words in there. So to help us understand, they put in business. But other translations say house, and that makes a bit more sense because that's where they find him, in his father's house. So whatever, but we'll go into a bit more about that in a minute now, because that's what I said before, you can see Yeshua is fully aware of his business, he's fully aware of who he is, and who his father is. And I just think that's an amazing statement, because as I say, he'll be back in 18 years, speaking to these people about his father. And I think we'll have a look at some of that just now, to be honest, yeah. Let's have a look at some wonderful scriptures about the cons just consistently Yeshua's mission, Yeshua's purpose, Yeshua's motivation. Just like we see in the Torah, it was love for the Father. He loved the Father. You know, we see that so often, but I'll just go to John chapter 2. And that's what I'm saying is Yeshua back in the same place. He's in the same place 18 years later. You're at, at the age of 30. John chapter 2. Same time of year. John chapter 2 verse 13. Now the Passover of the Jews was at hand and Yeshua went up to Jerusalem and he found in the temple those who sold oxen and sheep and doves and the money changers doing business. When he had made a whip of cords, he drove them out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen and poured out the changes money and overturned the table. And he said to those who sold doves, take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of merchandise. Beautiful, isn't it? The age of 12, doesn't you know I'll be about my father's house? The age of 30, is cleansing his father's house. We looked at this a bit more on Saturday, didn't we? Shabbat, when uh, the instructions were passed over to get the leaven out of your house in preparation for unleavened bread, get the leaven out of your house. And so this is Yeshua cleansing the father's house at the time of Passover. So he's saying, take these things away. Don't make my father's house a house of merchandise. Then his disciples, listen to this, then his disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house has eaten me up. Now let's look at what this zeal, I mean, we all know, but carry on. Zeal for your house has eaten me up. You see, was cleansing the temple of all of the leaven. What's going on, all of the merchandise and that's going on. And they remember that zeal for your house has eaten me up. So the Jews answered and said to him, what signs do you do to show us since you do these things? Yeshua answered and said to them, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. Then the Jews said, it's taken 46 years to build this temple and will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body, the zeal for the father's house was going to lead to Yeshua laying his life down, wasn't it? It's going to lead to Yeshua's crucifixion, the zeal for the father's house. Where the, where the, you know, where the temple army? It's this temple that he's got so much zeal for us, but he was speaking of the temple of his body. Therefore, when he had risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this to them and they believed the scripture and the words which he had said. So I'm only just beginning to go through a little brief narrative of Yeshua's awareness of the Father's business, the Father's business. Uh, Viv, Viv's just joining us, so I'm just letting you know we're in Luke chapter 2, Viv, that's where the narrative is today. We're going through Yeshua at the age of 12 in the temple as we continue our study in the Chronological Gospels, which we're doing every Monday at 2 o'clock now. Uh, Monday afternoon Bible study at two o'clock. Sorry, good evening. I saw this a bit late. I'm sorry for being so late. No problem. So uh, well, just so you know, and it's getting recorded to YouTube as well. So uh, I'm just doing a quick narrative into this um, 
Yeshua's connection with the Father. You know, he just said to Mary and Joseph, didn't you know I had to be about my father's business or my father's house? So straight away, 18 years later, at the same feast of Passover, Yeshua is concerned about his father's house and zeal for your house is consuming, which will lead, as he's revealing here, to the destruction of his own temple, his own body. We're going to stay in John for a little bit. Look at John 4. John 4, I mentioned it before, Shechem, the woman at the well. But I'm going to just cut to the end of that story. John chapter 4, this is when he's had the interaction with the woman at the well. The disciples come back in verse 33. Therefore, the disciples said to one another, has anyone brought him anything to eat? Because Yeshua has just said, sorry, I have food to eat of which you do not know. Yeshua has got food to eat of which you do not know. So his disciples wonder well, has anyone brought him anything to eat? Yeshua said to them, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. See, this is Yeshua's food. This is how much Yeshua's life is about doing the Father's business. The Father's will, the will of him who sent me. John 5, now, next chapter, John 5. It's Yeshua in the same place that he was at 18 years ago. When they were all amazed at him, when they were all, wow, the wisdom, his questions and his answers, his interaction as he sat in the temple in the midst of all the elders and they were amazed. He's in the same place 18 years later with the same people or the sons of the same people. They're well aware of him. And look at his words. You know, we'll obviously go through all this in the weeks, months to come. Every word, every detail of these events. But I'm just going through briefly connecting Yeshua's connection with the Father. So we're in John 5. And verse 16, and this is after Yeshua has just healed a man who's been lame for 38 years. 38 years, just like Deuteronomy chapter 2, the Israelites wandered for 38 years after the incidents at Kadesh, Kadesh Barnea and the refusal to enter the land. 38 years, Deuteronomy says that's the connection with John 5. So after he's done this, and it happens on the Sabbath, it says that this 4, 16, John 5, for this reason the Jews persecuted Yeshua and sought to kill him because he had done these things on the Sabbath. But Yeshua answered them, my father has been working until now and I have been working. Therefore the Jews sought all the more to kill him. So in John 5, because he had not only broke the Sabbath, because he also said that God was his father making himself equal with God. Then Yeshua answered and said to them, most assuredly, Amen, Amen. I say to you, the Son can do nothing of himself but what he sees the Father do. For whatever he does, the Son also does in like manner. For the Father loves the Son and shows him all things that he himself does. And he will show him greater works than these that you may marvel. But as the Father raises the dead and gives life to them, even so the Son gives life to whom he wills. For the Father judges no one, but has committed all judgment to the Son. All That all should honour the Son, just as they honour the Father. He who does not honour the Son does not honour the Father who sent him. I mean, this is, I could keep on reading, but I'm just giving you more and more scriptures that just build upon this connection, this relationship between Yeshua, who is fully aware that he's the son, and fully aware, right at the age of 12, who his father is. Who his father is. Amazing stuff. I'm going to continue. John chapter 7, verse 16. Just more of the same. John chapter 7 is the Feast of Tabernacles. It's Yeshua in the same place in his father's house in the temple. John chapter 7, verse 16. Yeshua answered them and said, My doctrine is not mine, but his who sent me. 
when you read John a lot, you keep seeing this phrase of being sent. You sure it, it gets even better later on in John, and you show up. I'm back in John 3 and forward into John 8, except when Yeshua is saying he came from above and he's going to return to where he came from. I mean, Yeshua is fully aware where he came from. He was with the Father before he came, wasn't he? So Yeshua is aware of this. But now he's on earth. He's not here to start some new religion. He's telling us, I, my doctrine's not mine, but his who sent me. If anyone wants to do his will, he will know concerning the doctrine, whether it's from God or whether I speak on my own authority. He who speaks from himself seeks his own glory, but he who seeks the glory of the one who sent him is true, and no unrighteousness is in him. Did not Moses give you the Torah? None of you keeps the Torah. Why do you seek to kill me? See, let's go back to John 5 when they sought to kill him. He went like that when he was only 12. It's about, it's about his father's business. Examples. I think my camera's gone off. I want to go back on. Back on. Uh, John chapter 8. So we're just staying in the narrative of John, really, and that's what I am doing. You know, John, in case you haven't heard me say this before, is, um, is, is a amazing it's an amazing journey through the feasts i mean virtually all of john apart from a couple of instances are all at jerusalem at a feast it's just, ah, all of it's so set john is just doing the narrative at, from the feasts and hanukkah is, is obviously part of it but it's chronological it goes through the feasts it's presenting the lamb of god in the context of the feasts. And that's why I'm doing it from John now, and this consistent language of John. So John chapter 8, which is actually at Hanukkah, uh, verse 19. Oh, sorry, going back to verse... Well, really, John 8... You know, starting from verse 11 is when Yeshua announces that he's the light of the world. This is a very sensible thing to say. A Hanukkah known as the festival of lights. But th then he questioned his authority. And so straight away, Yeshua, uh, and, and also, you don't know your father. That's the whole context in John chapter 8. And Yeshua is saying in verse 14, even if I bear witness of myself, my witness is true. But I know where I came from and where I'm going. For you do not know where I came from and where I'm going. You judge according to the flesh. I judge no one. And yet if I do judge, my judgment is true. For I am not alone, for I am with the Father who sent me. It is also written in your Torah that the testimony of two men is true. I am one who bears witness of myself, and the Father who sent me bears witness of me. So that's Hanukkah. That is Yeshua again. Connecting with the Father who sent him, making us know he knew where he came from. He will go back there. This is what he's telling them. So go to the end of this narrative of Hanukkah and you get to John chapter 10. John chapter 10 is when they say to him, How long, verse 23, Yeshua was walking in the temple back in the same place in Solomon's porch, and the Jews surrounded him and said to him, how long do you keep us in, in doubt? If you are the Messiah, tell us plainly. Yeshua answered them, I told you, and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. But you do not believe, because you are not of my sheep, as I said to you. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my father's hands. I and my father are one. Wow. You know, Yeshua understands who he is. At the age of 12, he understood who he was and where he was at Jerusalem, at the Feast of Passover. He was about his father's house, his father's business. And so finally, Matthew 26, 
finally on that note of the Father and the Son. Matthew 26, verse 36. This is Yeshua in Gethsemane. Matthew 26, verse 36. We read at the start of this little narrative of the Father in John 4, didn't we, when Yeshua said to his disciples, my food is to do the Father's will and to accomplish, to finish it, to complete it. Here's Yeshua, Gethsemane, the night before his passion. Verse 36, Yeshua came with them to a place called Gethsemane and said to the disciples, sit here while I go and pray over there. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee. And he began to be sorrowful and deeply distressed. Then he said, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. Stay here and watch me. Then he went a little farther and fell on his face and prayed, saying, Oh, my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, and this is the whole point, not as I will, but as you will. Yeshua at the age of 12 knew he was about the father's business. Yeshua at the age of 30 knew he was about the father's business. Yeshua knew what he came into this world to do. Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. Quoting from the Psalms. Verse 5. Therefore, when he came into... Well, I better go back. I'm going to do it all. The Hebrews chapter 10. For the law, having a shadow of good things to come, shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never, can never, with these sacrifices which they offer continually, year by year, make those who approach perfect. For then would they not have ceased to be offered? For the worshippers once purified would have had no more conscience of sin. Obviously, Hebrews was addressing the fact that that the physical system was fading away, becoming obsolete and had been superseded by a different priesthood, the Melchizedek priesthood, which Yeshua is the high priest of. And this is what it's saying. Verse 3, but in no sacrifices there's a reminder of sins every year, for it's not possible, it's not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sins. Therefore, therefore, when he came into the world, he said, Yeshua, sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you have prepared for me. You see, Yeshua is in Gethsemane. He knows what's about to take place. I don't want to take this cup. Nevertheless, nevertheless, this is all written about me. A body you prepared for me. In bed, this is what he said in the temple, wasn't it? In John chapter 2. Destroy this temple, and in three days I'll raise it up. Yeshua's fully aware of the Father's business. A body you prepare for me, in burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, you had no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I have come in the volume of the book it is written of me to do your will, O oh God. Get seventy. I don't want to do this. Nevertheless, not what I will, what you will. It's written in the volume of the book to do your will, O oh God. You've prepared a body for me to take the place of those Levitical sacrifices, which were all a shadow of me. Carrying on in Hebrews chapter 10, they say, previously saying sacrifice and offerings, Burnt offerings and offering for sin you did not desire, now nor have pleasure in them which are offered according to the law. Then he said, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God. He takes away the first that he may establish the second. By that will, by that will, the gardener gets many, your will, the Father's business. By that will, we have been sanctified. Through the offer offering of the body of Yeshua the Messiah once for all. 
Hallelujah, Father. I'm so glad that we're back in this study. <laughs> so glad to be reading the Gospels again. So glad to be reading these scriptures again and just sitting there going, thank you, Lord, that I can sit here, but that I am seated in you. And you are seated in him in heavenly places because Yeshua came to do the Father's will. And that's what he's saying back in Luke. He's saying to, to his mother Miriam and to Joseph, didn't you understand? I had to be about my father's business. Amazing. <laughs> Amazing. Matthew Henry's got a good point on it, though, because he's saying he did have understanding, didn't he? You know, when, when Gabriel's been to see her and when you've had dreams and God's told you, look, this son, and he's going to be the son of God. And, you know, when he's been told these things, you know there's something special, don't you? But their concept would have been, well, he's going to be a king. He's the son of David. He's going to sit on a throne. He's going to be the king. That's what they would have expected. So why are you in the temple? What, why is your father's house a big issue here? He didn't understand at this stage that he is a king and a priest. King and a priest. That's why the wise men brought gifts of gold and for the king frankincense in there for the priest and so now we're seeing Yeshua really in an amazing context as we read at the start sitting sitting in the temple sitting in the temple as a king and priest that's who he is isn't he so that's amazing so we're nearly at the end of this little narrative now into Luke, and then we're going to finish off this narrative, and then we're just going to start the next session. So I'll just show you what I want to show you, and then leave you to ponder that, really, and hope you do. So we finished that bit in, in Luke. Where are we now? Um, Luke chapter 2. Okay, verse 50. So we've said that, but they did not understand the statements which he spoke to them concerning being about his father's business. Okay. Um, and so finally, last couple of verses. Uh, so then he went down with them. Said that started, he went up to Jerusalem, and now they're going down to Nazareth. He went down with them and came to Nazareth. I'm a subject to them. But his mother kept all these things in her heart. That doesn't half your mind, it doesn't it? Oh, remember, in, is it Genesis 37, when uh, Joseph was given his dreams to his brothers and to his father? And even though Jacob, Yaakov, wasn't too happy, wasn't with him, he was a bit sort of, oh, what is that to say? It says, nonetheless, that he kept these things in his heart, pondered these things in his heart, the dreams that Joseph had. And so, you know, Miriam's the same. She didn't understand everything, but she certainly kept these things in her heart. And that's what we have to do. If we don't understand things, keep them. Keep the things. I've got some real beautiful things that God's revealed to me over the years because I've kept them in my heart and keep seeking. And I'm still seeking insight into some things. And I know your answer. <laughs> it does at the right time. But we've got to keep these things, haven't we? Because we have a tendency as humans, don't we, to hear things and then let it go out the other ear. In one ear, out the other. This is what we see in the way go, what God says to Adam. Guard the garden. Guard. And then throughout the Torah, we get told other things that we need to guard and keep. Like guard the Sabbath. Keep the Sabbath. Guard the month of the Aviv. Because in that month, we celebrate Passover. There's things that our God has given us to guard and keep. Mike does the ironic lesson every week, don't you, Mike? And it's Ibanecha, Yehovah, by Ishbanecha, Yehovah, Panabelecha, Bekunecha, and it's Yehovah, bless you and keep you. Keep you. So we need to learn to keep things in our heart, don't we? She kept these things in her heart, and Yeshua increased this way. We started today when he was a baby, child, he was growing, wasn't he? In this way, in wisdom, in the spirit, and now he's increasing in wisdom and stature, and in favour with God and men. So that's a beautiful end to that narrative of Yeshua being 12, and we'll just finish that bit. we just set where we started before, Lord. Thank you for causing us to 
increase in wisdom and in favour in stature with God and with men, Lord. All for your glory. Thank you, Lord, that you are in the business of causing us to mature, in the business of completing the work that you've begun in us. I'm so glad. Thank you, Lord, for Yeshua, who has made all this possible, that we can call you Father, <laughs> that we can be part of the Father's house, all because of what your Son did in obedience. Amen. Amen. So we're going to finish off in a minute. And all we're going to do now is go into the next part of this study. Uh, we're going to keep this to about an hour every week, Mike, aren't we? And it looks to me like we've just been going for just under an hour to me. So five minutes, maybe, so, and we'll finish off. And we're just carrying on in the narrative. Uh, just an introduction now to what I think a lot of you know I, I understand about this ministry of Yeshua. And it's so fitting after the Sabbath that we just mentioned this again, that in the Sabbath study, we got the instructions for Passover. And in them instructions, we saw that we had to take a lamb, a male, spotless and without blemish, a lamb of the first year. And that is what I understand. That you see, when, when we get told in the Gospels, behold the lamb of God, it's only twice. It's only twice in the Gospels that Yeshua is referred to as the Lamb of God. And it's by the same man. It's by John the Baptist. When Yeshua comes out of the wilderness, it actually is. John the Baptist says, behold the Lamb of God. who takes away the sins of the world. He says it again the next day, this week, behold the Lamb of God. That's the only times Yeshua is referred to as the Lamb of God in the Gospels. 30 odd times, I think 30 times, Yeshua is referred to as the Lamb of God in the book of Revelation. But in the Gospels twice, and it's on the same occasion by the same man who is John the Baptist, who is a priest, according to God's order of things. He was a, his mum and dad, Zechariah, who was a priest in the temple, and his mum, Elisheva, were both Levites, they're both Aaron's line. So John the Baptist was a 100% Aaronic priest, and completely in the right line to be God's chosen priest. And so it's quite like that he makes this priestly pro proclamation of behold the Lamb of God. And so really, it should, I think, be pretty clear at that stage that, wow, Yeshua's got a year to go then, because he is going to die as our ah, Passover, as first, uh, as Corinthians chapter, first Corinthians chapter 5 says, Messiah is our Passover. As Peter says, we have not been redeemed with silver and gold, perishable things like silver and gold, but with the precious blood of a lamb. So Yeshua's ministry was a year, just over a year. And that's not a new thing. That's what I'm going to show you now. That's not something that I've just read recently and some fella on YouTube. Oh, oh it's going to go well back. It's going well back. I'm going to get into this more and more. That's not all this is about, but this is an appropriate point to show you this bit. So we're in Luke chapter 3, we're just carrying on. Luke chapter 3, and it says this. Now in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea, Herod being tetrarch of Iturea and the region of Saconitis, and Lysanias, uh, tetrarch of Abilene, while Annas and Caiaphas were high priests. We'll probably talk about that a bit more next week. Where high priests, the word of God, we'll definitely talk about this more actually, came to Yochanan, John, Yochanan, really, the son of Zachariah in the wilderness. So we'll get into that in more detail, but the first line of that is what I want to look at now. In the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar. So now I'm going to just screen share. These are from my notes, which anyone's welcome to have. If you want the chronological gospels, you just need to let me know. You know, put a note in the YouTube, send me an email, Stephen MacDonald777 at gmail.com, and I'll send you the chronological gospels, which has been typed out. Beautiful to read, fantastic. Word for word, I've just used the new King James and put it in chronological order. But, so this is from your notes, which I'll screen share now. There we go. That's big enough to see, isn't it? So here's what we just read. 
Luke chapter 3, verse 1. Now, in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius of Caesar. So, this now is a book called Stromata, uh, book one, by a man called Clement of Alexandria. So, before I read that, let me just go to the Catholic Encyclopedia. This is from the Catholic Encyclopedia. You can, read, you can check this out yourself, go online, and there's a section about the uh, length of Yeshua's ministry, and they obviously make the case for three and a half years. That's where it comes from. It was initially introduced by Eusebius in the fourth century. And you can see this in the Catholic Encyclopedia. We probably will look at this again, maybe in time to come. But for now, this is what the Catholic Encyclopedia says. There are two extreme views as to the length of the ministry of Jesus. Saint Irenaeus is very famous because he was a disciple of Polycarp, and Polycarp was a disciple of John, the Apostle John. Apostle John taught Polycarp, Polycarp taught Irenaeus. Irenaeus, in his letter against heresies, appears to suggest a period of 15 years. <laughs> so if you want to go with it's not who you what's not what you know, it's who you know. Well, Irenaeus, you've got to really sort of favor what he has to say because he's saying. 15 years, not three and a half. And that's all the point I want to make is going as far back as Irenaeus. He wasn't saying it was a three and a half year ministry. He was saying it was a 15 year ministry. I've heard 20 from other sources, but the Catholic Encyclopedia, fair play that they're at least telling us this. But then we go to this, the prophetic phrases, the year of recompenses, the year of my redemption, which comes to us from Isaiah chapter 34, verse 8, and chapter 63, verse 4, appear to have induced Clement of Alexandria, where we'll read him in a minute. Julius Africanus. Now, this takes a long time. It took me ages to find the Clement of Alexandria thing that I'm going to show you. But if anyone feels led to study Julius Africanus or Philastrius, I don't know if the pronunciation is right, and Hilarion, if you want to go and check them out, that would be a great thing for you to do. But amongst them <laughs> and two or three other patristic writers, they allow only one year for the public life. Now, these people are before Eusebius, who in the fourth century suggested a three and a half year ministry, which has been adopted by the Catholic Church and adopted by Christendom, it seems to me. I have, over the last seven or eight years, I can't I believe the amount of times and the amount of sermons I've heard with Yeshua's ministries three and a half years, and I have never once heard it in any context or with any relevance. It's just a throwaway comment. Oh, and Yeshua's three and a half years. Oh, I've heard it so many times by people I greatly admire. I hasten to add people I greatly admire who said this time and time again, no, with no, no reference to anything, no context at all. It's just sadly one of the things we have inherited and it's almost like sort of taken as fact. Well, it wasn't by Clements of Alexandria <laughs> and it wasn't by Julius Africanus, Philastus, Larion and two or three others. This is not a new thing. Three and a half years is a new thing. The latter opinion has found advocates among certain recent students. Von Soden, for instance, defends it in Cheney's Encyclopedia Biblica. Westcott and Hort omit the expression the Pasch or the Passover in John chapter 6, verse 4, which is when we will come back to this in greater detail, to compress the ministry of Jesus within the space of one year. So you've got some great scholars who are not phased at all and they can see quite clearly and one of the reasons for doing this chronological gospel study word by word verse by verse is it gets clearer when we get through it that this is the lamb of god the passover lamb of the first year but what i want you to and john 6 4 is the relevant thing here which introduces a, the, a passover and I'm really glad to hear Vicky on, uh, on the Shabbat. She's obviously studying, doing due diligence into these issues. And she mentioned the study 
of Nehemia Gordon, and you can search that for yourself. It's like a four session study with Nehemia Gordon and another Christian scholar where they have really delved into this. And Vicky brought that to our attention on Shabbat. And it's absolutely safe to say these things. It's well researched by many, many people. And I am part of that group that is coming against the three and a half year ministry and advocating the lamb of the first year, which is what the Passover lamb of God has to be. You can see it's not a new thing. It's not a Michael Rood thing, although I greatly value and I'm so glad I came across that ministry that's introduced me to this and has done a lot more work on putting the Gospels together chronologically. But the idea that Yeshua had a one year ministry goes right back to, you can see, the Clement of Alexandria there, which I'm going to read. Sorry, I haven't even read that yet. So I'll read that now and we'll finish. This is what Clement of Alexandria said. Catholic Encyclopedia has pointed us in that direction. And this is what Clement of Alexandria said. So let's read it, son. And then we're done. So this is Clement from Stromata, Book One. So we can see Clement of Alexandria is from the year 150 to 215, you know, much earlier than Eusebius. He, Eusebius became the court official, you see, of uh, Constantine, who set up this Catholic faith. So this is what Clement said. The followers of Basilides hold the day of Yeshua's baptism as a festival. No one's saying that you have to do that, but that just, this is the point. Spending the night before the readings, and they say that it was the, and that's why we need this, the 15th year of Tiberius. Well, they say it, but more importantly, Luke has just said it, hasn't he? That's what we started off, Luke chapter 3, verse 1. The 15th year of Tiberius is when Yeshua was baptised. That's what's getting said here. Yeshua was baptised by John the Baptist in the 15th year of Tiberius. John, uh, Luke confirms that. But treating of his passion as crucifixion with very great accuracy. And I've just omitted something there because it just gives you Roman dates that wouldn't, didn't, I couldn't understand them. It's just, it's Roman dates, but the, we, we know when Yeshua was crucified. But what they're saying is with very great actually, accuracy, some say it took place in the 16th year of Tiberius. Thus, this is Clement's words, the Saviour suffered and that it was necessary for him to preach only a year, this also was written. He had sent me to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. This spoke the prophet spoke and the gospel. This is still planning. Accordingly, in 15 years of Tiberius and 15 years of Augustus, so we completed the 30 years, not 33, 30 years till the time he suffered. So I'm sticking with what Clement had to say and others have had to say, I'm not buying into the Roman Catholic three and a half year narrative. We'll see why. But we're just getting going in the Gospels. That's not the be all and end all of this study. The be all and end all of this study is to read every word of the Gospels, to hear what Yeshua says, to see what Yeshua does and to do the same things. <laughs> just like Yeshua said, I just do what the Father says. I just, just do what I see the Father do. Well, we want to just see what Yeshua does and hear what Yeshua says and do it. And that's the purpose of this study. But it is in the context of Yeshua's ministry as the Lamb of God, the Passover Lamb of the first year, spotless and without blemish. Amen. So thanks for joining us for this part of the study. We'll be back next week. We'll continue in this narrative of Luke chapter 3. And we'll be going through the ministry of John the Baptist. And Mark and uh, Matthew will come into play as we put it all together to get one beautiful, seamless narrative of the four Gospels combined to bring us the Gospels in chronological order. It's fantastic. So I'm so grateful for doing this. I'm so grateful to you, Heavenly Father, for the time, the inclination, the zeal to do this. So grateful for the people to do it with, Lord. And I just pray that this will be a wonderful blessing to everyone involved, Father. So in all, in the name of Yeshua, all glory to you, Lord. Thank you for what you've done for us. That you began a great work in us and you will complete the work that you began in us. Thank you, Lord. 
in Yeshua's name. Amen. 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 God bless Steve.